Hi guys, thank you ever so much for inviting me today. So yeah, I'd like to give an update on our ongoing research into adamantinomas, and this is funded by the, the uh, Liz Clark Sowell Fund, uh, an ideas grant. Uh, so adamantinomas, I expect a lot of people in the room know a lot about this already, they are incredibly rare uh, tumours, and they look like a bunch of other tumours uh, that we see, apart from the main difference being that these adamantinomas are somewhat more aggressive. They tend to recur, and often you end up with metastases as well. So although they look very similar to other tumours, particularly this osteofibrous-like adamantinoma, this is kind of a much more benign kind of tumour, these guys, much more aggressive, they look very similar. So the kind of our first research question is, can we find some sort of biomarkers that can distinguish these two things? And while we're looking for biomarkers, it seems to make an awful lot of sense if we can find something that not only distinguishes between these different types of tumours, but also if we can find some kind of protein in the adamantinomas, let's make sure we can find something which may also be a therapeutic target at the same time, something which we can target to try and kill these cells. And the last of these questions we're worried about is... Uh, not all of these adamantinomas metastasize. There's a subset of even more aggressive adamantinomas that do metastasize. So if we're looking for biomarkers, can we identify something that can also distinguish the most aggressive adamantinomas compared to those somewhat less aggressive that don't seem to metastasize? So these are our main clinical questions. We started off by doing some genetics. We acquired a selection of adamantinomas and these less malignant OFD-like tumours. We extracted the genomic DNA from these. We carried out a genome sequencing project. So we sequenced all the protein-coding genes in all of these tumours. We were looking for mutations. We were hoping to find mutations which were specific to the adamantinomas and not present in these uh, OFD tumours. And basically, we didn't find anything very interesting at all. We didn't see any mutations which were specific to the adamantinomas. But as part of this data... <laughs> We also uh, get extra information from this sequencing project. And we could see that in the adamantinomas, some of the genes had been amplified. And this is a common thing that happens as cancers develop. As your cancer cells divide, they have to replicate their DNA, and they're starting to lose control of this process. So sometimes whole genes or large regions of chromosomes can be amplified. Within this chromosomal amplification region, you find specific genes. So we found quite a few genes which were amplified in addition to the single copy that there should be in normal cells. I'm sure most people in the room are familiar with the basic idea of molecular cell biology. This is it. A single gene should encode for a single protein. And the proteins are the building blocks of the cells. These are the things which we want to look at. We want to design drugs to attack. So one gene makes one protein by this intermediary molecule called RNA. So we suspect if you see gene amplifications from our sequencing project, we expect we should also be able to see more of this intermediary molecule RNA. If we can see more RNA, this should, as a consequence, make more proteins. So amplified genes should make more proteins, and hopefully these proteins can be these biomarkers we're trying to find, an upregulation specific to the aggressive tumours. So we went off and checked this. We did some RNA analysis, global RNA analysis, where we checked all the RNA in all the cells of all the tumours, and we did indeed find some upregulated RNA that were associated with the gene amplification, in addition to uh, RNA that was upregulated because of gene amplification. We found loads of other genes which were upregulated, not associated with gene amplification. Um, why they're upregulated? There's many, many complicated reasons why they may or may not be. As far as I'm concerned today, it doesn't matter why they're upregulated. They are, and we can see them. We can see there's an upregulation of RNA, specifically in the adamantinoma. So we have quite a big list from this large global study. About 100 different genes were upregulated, specifically in the adamantinomas. So we want to then go and look at specific ones of these. So we decided to make a short list. So we thought about our big list of possible candidates and did some thinking about how biology works. So we picked 25 genes based on what we know that they do. And these were mainly uh, genes that make proteins that live on the surface of cells. Forgive the complicated figure. This is supposed to be a cell. This is the surface of the cell, and some proteins poke out of the top of it. These receptor proteins generally tell cells to grow. You know, if they're growing out of control, it's because there's too much of this stuff going on. 
And these uh, receptors also signal to other proteins that tell the cell to grow. These kind of proteins which are often called kinases. So we're picking a load of these kinase proteins which say grow. And if they are upregulated, they're going to tell the cells to grow out of control. Uh, we also pick some genes which make proteins that tell cells to survive. So if you have a protein which specifically tells the cell don't die when you give it a drug which is supposed to be killing it and that's upregulated, this is common to a lot of cancers as a mechanism that stops um, your therapies from working. So we picked these 25 candidates based on what we know about the biology. We also specifically picked candidates where there was already drugs in clinical trials for other cancers ongoing to enable us to hopefully repurpose some therapies at the end to specifically target adamantinomas. So we have our 25 candidate genes from this list, and now we're going to go and uh, study each one of these genes one at a time, starting by looking at the RNA, this intermediary molecule. So we do a process called quantitative PCR. And I bet almost everybody in this room is very familiar with quantitative PCR nowadays. A year ago, two years ago, you wouldn't know what you were talking about. This is your COVID test. This is exactly the same technology. If you've had a PCR test for COVID, you've had a quantitative PCR carried out on your, um, on your sample. So I've got these tumours, and I'm looking at the RNA specifically for individual genes which make individual proteins by quantitative analysis. And we're looking for genes which are upregulated in adamantinomas. Uh, so each one of these dots is a tumour. And each one of these dots all lumped together at the bottom here are tumours. These are these less malignant tumours, and these are the adamantinomas. So we can see there's an upregulation of this particular gene. So we've confirmed our global RNA analysis. This seems to be upregulated, as does this one. And this one is the same kind of idea. Of our 25, we only actually confirmed six of those 25. The rest we couldn't confirm. And that's not unusual. Global RNA analysis is a very noisy uh, technique, and you get a lot of false positives and false negatives. But we've confirmed in this much more accurate analysis six candidates. So we've got these six new candidates which we think are good targets. But really, we want to see proteins. Proteins are the business end of this. These are the things which the drugs target. So we've done some staining with antibodies against the proteins that these genes and RNA make. This is this epidermal growth factor, which we saw on the previous slide. Now we are seeing relatively light staining in this OFD tumour and much higher staining. The brown is the same. So if it's darker staining, there's more of it. There is staining in the OFD, but it's much stronger in the more malignant tumours. This experiment was carried out uh, blinded. So we had two scientists doing all of this. One scientist would do the would do the staining with the antibodies and then give it to another scientist and not tell them which was which, which one is the adamantinoma, which one is the OFD tumour. And they just had to say how strong they thought the staining was to generate the data here. And generally, the adamantinomas would end up on one pile and the OFDs on another pile just by the strength of the staining uh, without them actually knowing what they were looking at. This is good practice to prevent um, bias, unconscious bias in your analysis. If we zoom in on this... You can see there are some cells here. These are uh, the blue circles are the nuclei of these cells. The blue is staining for the DNA in the cells, and the brown is the cytoplasm of the cells, and the brown is specific expression of this one protein, this epidermal growth factor. We can see regions which are very highly stained. And we see some staining in the OFDs, but it's much more obvious in the adamantinoma. We've done this for a couple of our uh, six candidates now. I want to briefly mention BCL2 because we know loads about BCL2. There have been years and years and years of research about this protein. This is a survival factor. If this is upregulated, this correlates to your treatment generally not working and tumours recurring. It's a, it tells your cells don't die. And it's upregulated really nicely. High levels are in quite a lot of the adamantinomas relative to the less uh, malignant tumour. So we think this is a nice candidate as well. The work's ongoing. We've got more of these to do. Um, so to conclude what I'm trying to show you here, we've identified some genes and proteins, importantly it's proteins, that are upregulated specifically in adamantinoma. We can see these using really standard pathological techniques, the kind of techniques that um, the pathologists, the clinicians in, do on your biopsies as we speak. So it's standard technique and it 
seems to sh identify specific proteins. That work's ongoing. We've got more, much more of that to do. But then we want to move forward now to the next step, which we haven't started, and that's thinking about uh, can we correlate overexpression of some of these interesting targets, these proteins, with the more aggressive metastatic adenantinomas? Um, and eventually, can we kill specifically adenantinoma tumours using existing therapies that target these proteins? And I've recently been having conversations with a colleague of mine at the University of Manchester who also has uh, a brain, brain cancer research trust uh, grant studying adamantinomas, and they are growing adamanta tumor cells in dishes at the moment from live uh, biopsies. So we're going to try and collaborate on this so if we can take my targets and her cells, see if we can start killing these cells. So this is, as you saw in the morning, this is the very beginning. Uh, uh, as other people say, you've got to start this preclinical stage, but hopefully we can confirm the preclinical stuff and jump very quickly further along the line because the therapies we're looking at are in clinical trials for things like uh, lymphomas and breast cancer and things like that. So they're already, already being trialled, so they're, they're approved uh, therapies already. Okay, so I'd like to end there. Just to say that most of the work was done at the University of Wolverhampton. Myself and Linda Birch did all the RNA work. Dr. Omar and his PhD students did all the immunostaining. A lot of the statistics was done by Stefani at the University of Milan. Um, the preliminary Molecular genetics was done by Nasser Ali as part of his PhD studentship under the supervision of Professor Fried Latif at the University of Birmingham. And I need to thank Royal Orthopaedic Hospital and all the staff there for providing the samples and being just an enormous help. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank Liz Clark Sowell again, her family, friends for enabling this work. Rare cancers <coughs> deserve to be studied however rare they are because they're different. All cancers are different. You need to do the study. So I really appreciate the opportunity to do this work. All right, thank you ever so much. Hi. Hi, Hi Mark. I'm Vicky. Hi. Um, it's very interesting. I wanted to check with you. So ETFR and BCL2, they're normally... I mustn't say always, but commonly are regulated in most, uh, many solid tumours. Yeah. So, is, have you compared, are the levels of, that you see in adamantinoma mm -hmm. even greater than, say, for example, osteosarcoma, or, is, or, or what you are saying is the comparison between a benign tumour and an so aggressive tumour? So, we think it's more than benign tumours. Yeah. Um, but we haven't compared it directly, so I wouldn't like to say with this, without doing the actual direct comparison, yeah. I wouldn't like to say. My suspicion is not more than yeah. other malignant tumours. I also need to say, we've got other candidates Otherwise. which are considerably rarer than these. I know those of you in the room yeah. that are familiar yeah. are saying, yeah, well, we've seen these, these yeah. candidates before. We are having a slight delivery problem with some of our antibodies, so I, I've still got yeah. quite a lot of work still to do yeah. to confirm the, um, the more interesting RNA, so... But yeah, it's a really, really good point. These are commonly known proteins, yeah. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, thank you ever so much. Thank you so much.